If you'd be so kind as to take your seats, I'll open us with a word of prayer, and then I'm going to introduce our speaker for the day, and then I'm going to turn it over to Brian McGreevy, because if I don't, he'll explode. <laughs> Let us pray. Lord, teach thy people to love thy house best of all dwellings. Thy scriptures, best of all books. Thy sacraments, best of all gifts. The communion of saints, best of all company. And that we may as one family and in one place give thanks and adore thy glory. Help us to keep always thy day, the first of days, holy unto thee, our maker, our resurrection, and our life. God blessed forever. Amen. Well, we are honored today to have a guest speaker here for the Rector's Forum. Uh, he was one of the speakers at the Mere Anglicanism Conference over the course of the weekend. And let me say, I'll say it again in church, but let me say a special thank you to everyone who helped out with that conference. We have sold out crowd. crowd. Um, the music hall was absolutely packed. It was a marvelous weekend. All of the presenters were first rate. They did an extraordinary job, and I think many people were blessed. And I will say to our choir and our music directors, that was an extraordinary worship service on Friday night. Uh, Dr. Jerry Root, uh, who is the um, professor at Wheaton College and one of the presenters, uh, told the entire conference on the last day that that was the most moving worship service he'd ever been to in his entire life. So praise the Lord for that. Lots of Hard work went into it. Uh, it was a team effort, but it was a great success, and we're so grateful. But we are honored today to have with us the Reverend Dr. Michael Ward as our guest preacher and our speaker here in this Rector's Forum. Um, Dr. Ward is an English literary critic. He is a theologian. He is the author of several books, including the award-winning Planet Narnia, The Seven Heavens in the Imagination of C.S. Lewis. He is on the faculty um, at Oxford University, uh, and theology, and he is generally regarded as the foremost C.S. Lewis scholar in the world. And so, as you can imagine, Brian has been following him all over. <laughs> Jesus said, come follow me, and I have to keep reminding Brian that, you know, that's his real calling, but nevertheless... So delighted to have Dr. Ward with us, and I'm going to turn it over to Brian to go ahead and lead us through a conversation with Dr. Ward. But Dr. Ward, on behalf of St. Philip's Church, we are honored to have you here in the city of Charleston and at the Mother Church of Anglicanism south of Virginia. God bless you. Well, good morning to all of you, and it is a great privilege to have Dr. Ward with us, and we are going to try to cover a couple of topics this morning uh, that I hope will be of interest to you, uh, not just of intellectual interest, but things that will be of spiritual encouragement to you. And one of the great things about having Dr. Ward here is that not only is he an expert scholar on C.S. Lewis and Tolkien and many other things, but he is a devout man of faith as well. So there's much that we can learn. But I'd like to begin by asking you, how did you become acquainted with the writings of C.S. Lewis uh, for the first time, and what has led you down the path that you are on now? Well, I got into Narnia um, as a young boy. That was my first introduction to C.S. Lewis. My parents read the Narnia Chronicles to me and my two brothers as we were very young. Uh, a vivid memory from my childhood was of, on a Sunday morning, piling into our parents' bed, her brother, her brother, mum, and brother, uh, and my mother would read a chapter or two from the latest Narnia Chronicle. Then we would get up and have breakfast and go off to church. Um, I remember that being a, a very happy, regular routine uh, as I was growing up. So the Narnia books were read to me before I was old enough to read them for myself. But when I was old enough to read them for myself, I did so repeatedly, and then got into the Rizal fiction and his Christian apologetics. Um, I went to Oxford, 
Oxford to do my first degree in English. And so I began to study some of Lewis's academic writings on English literature and did a short undergraduate thesis on him. And uh, did a bit of tutoring and was asked to give the occasional lecture on Lewis. Um, I helped out at the Oxford C.S. Lewis Society and ended up um, living in C.S. Lewis's house for three years. <laughs> Four days 
days of the week rather than the Roman days. But for those of us seven heavens, Sun, Moon, Mars, Mercury, Venus, Jupiter, and Saturn. So this is before the time of uh, a telescope. This is before Uranus and Neptune and Pluto have been discovered. These were the seven heavens, that could, the seven planets that could be discerned with the naked eye, and each was regarded as having a set of influences and attributes and qualities that, that they were shared upon the Earth and upon people and events. And, and so C.S. Lewis, being a medieval scholar, was very well aware of this old cosmological system, and he said of the planets that they were spiritual symbols of permanent value which were especially worthwhile in his own generation. And he writes about them all over the place in his academic works, in his poetry, and in his Ransom trilogy of interplanetary novels, where he uses this imagery very explicitly. When he came to write Narnia, I believe he used this symbolism again, except he used it implicitly, secretly. He wove the influences into the plot of each Narnia chronicle, and Aslan sums them up in his own person, and the children, as they grow and follow and love Aslan, they come to share those qualities themselves. And that was Lewis's governing imaginative logic. That was the imaginative blueprint that he was working to in these otherwise apparently <coughs> haphazardly assembled works. And once you see it, you can't not see it, because it makes such sense of so many otherwise puzzling oddities about the works. The obvious question is why Lewis kept it secret. But he, the reason he kept it secret was to, because he wanted to address our imaginations. He wanted to make us feel these seven spiritual symbols and how they work almost indiscernibly. It's, it's almost like a, a presentation of the Holy Spirit. Uh, you, you see the effects of the Spirit in the, in the blowing of the leaves on the tree, but you don't know where it comes from, where it's going. It's not something you look at, it's something you're, you're swept up by. And I think that's the reason that Lewis kept it secret, that he just wanted to immerse us into these seven spiritual symbols. And, and it's beautiful and sophisticated, and, and it, it increased my estimation of the Narnia Chronicles a hundredfold. I already loved these books and thought they were great. And then when I saw this whole other dimension of complexity and skill, I felt almost literally concussed. <laughs> How could a man be this brilliant and indeed this humble to allow his books to be dismissed as a bit of a hodgepodge of a mishmash by a certain period, when all the while he knew precisely how very intricate they were? I think it's a way, in a way, it's a sort of um, enacted parable that Lewis is to know as God is to the real world. And God does not force himself upon his creatures. God allows us to misinterpret him, to disobey him, to say that the universe is, is a chaos and, and not a creation. And likewise, Lewis, to Narnia, does not force his intentions upon either of the, the stories or the readers of the stories. Uh, he was just, as it were, patiently waiting for people to to pay sufficient attention that they would realize that it is. So it's a little bit like a kind of re religious conversion that the scales drop from your eyes and you suddenly see, oh, there, there is a reason why um, you know, Father Christmas is in the line of the witch of the world, right? uh, and other puzzling oddities. They suddenly make sense. It's absolutely beautiful. Yes. And I think one of the, the great things about it is that it is such an example of the great reverence that Lewis had for what we might call natural revelation, the way that God has littered the universe, the medieval cosmology, our own earth, with beauty and things that are types and shadows and pointers to him and the things of his kingdom. And you see that beautifully expressed in these Narnia stories. So I would commend you, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you've read the Narnia stories because I don't want to embarrass anyone who has not. Uh, but many people think of them as being for children. But one of Lewis's great quotations is that a good children's story is one that is as wonderful for a 50-year-old as it is for a small child. So I would commend them to you, and also Michael's book, because if you read his book and then reread those chronicles, they will come alive for you 
in a way, with the wonder of God and his creation uh, that is quite remarkable. So one of the things that we uh, talked about in the conference, the theme of the conference, was telling a more beautiful story, lessons from C.S. Lewis on reaching a fractured world. And obviously the Narnia Chronicles are stories. And the whole idea of story and myth, not in, the term, not in terms of something that's false, uh, a fable, but a myth as something that communicates a deep truth that is beyond our normal expression of words. These really informed Lewis's own spiritual journey from being a brilliant, what I would call, evangelical atheist uh, to coming to a deep faith in Jesus Christ through the influence of the Holy Spirit and through uh, the persistence of his friend uh, J.R.R. Tolkien. And one of the remarkable things is that when Lewis got onto, uh, let's just say, the train that led to his conversion, there was a mar remarkable change in his life and habits. And I would love to hear from you a little bit how, as Lewis uh, came to the Christian faith, how that was reflected in his own spiritual life and discipline and his understanding of what it meant to follow Christ particularly as an Anglican. Yes, uh, <coughs> Lewis had been raised as an Anglican. Uh, his grandfather had been a, a Church of Ireland clergyman um, of a fairly low church, evangelical kind. Um, and that's how Lewis was raised, he was baptized and taken to church and taught the usual things and confirmed in his teens. Um, but in his teens, he also turned away from the faith. And for nearly two decades, he called himself uh, an atheist, um, but then returned to the faith in his late 20s, early 30s uh, in Notional Park because of the influence of friends like Tolkien. Um, and once he had returned to our faith in God, and then in the Christian God in particular, he, he began flying his flag, he said, by a attending services in his college chapel and going to the local parish church, Holy Trinity, Teddington Quarry, where he is now buried. Um, and yes, became a, a devout and um, very active um, member of that parish and, and a public apologist and indeed you might say evangelist for the faith, uh, writing books about his conversion, beginning uh, with the Pilgrim's Regress, which is a, a sort of allegorical account of how he came to faith as an adult. And then in the 1940s, during the Second World War, he began to give broadcasts over the BBC radio, uh, broadcast talks which eventually were collected into the book Mere Christianity, um, which has gone on to be one of the most influential works of Christian apologetics of, of the last 70 years. Um, and then, of course, um, Narnia came on stream, as it were, in the 1950s. Um, but to, to your point about his, his practice of his faith, yes, I mean, Lewis was, um, he was, he was keen not to p p pigeonhole himself in, in, in anybody's mind. He, he wanted Remember, he'd grown up in Northern Ireland, in Ulster, in Belfast, a very sectarian, a very divided city, uh, where, po where politics was infecting religion, and, and the co community was very divided for all sorts of social and historical reasons, which really had almost nothing to do with the faith of, of these different communities. Um, and, and Lewis was always extremely keen to avoid any sort of denominational issues or party spirit. Um, so he, he says of himself that, that, that he's a neither particularly high Anglican nor a particularly low Anglican nor, nor particularly anything else Anglican. Um, mere Christianity is what he, he presents it um, as, as the thing that all Christians could um, affirm and, and center their, their the ecumenical dialogue upon, the great mainstream, the broad central tradition of the faith. Um, but of course he was in fact um, not quite so 
bland and neutral, as, as that description might suggest. He, um, he had quite a high practice of the faith. In fact, he, he liked to go to confession. And of course, in the Church of England, and nobody has to go to confession. You all may, some should, none must, is, is the, is the, is the, uh, is the mantra. But Lewis went regularly, frequently. Um, he, he found a, an Anglican priest in Oxford that, who he thought would be good for him as a confessor. And he wrote a letter saying, would you, would you start hearing my confession? And he said, well, uh, writing and posting that letter was one of the hardest things he ever did. Because <laughs> he realized he was, he was opening himself up to having to be uh, completely honest with this man. Um, and I think it was good for him. Because he had such uh, influence, it was good that he was accountable to, an, to another person, had a spiritual director, a confessor of that kind. Um, he had a high view of the priesthood. He, he believed in purgatory. Um, purgatory of a, of a particular kind. He, he distinguished it from cor corrupt versions of the doctrine of purgatory. But basically said, when we die, we, we're, we're not usually, most of us, in a state of absolutely perfected sanctity. Yet we know that nothing unclean can enter into, into heaven and, and stand before God. Um, we know that from the book of Revelation. Um, so how is it that those who are not yet perfectly clean can go and see the face of God? There's a cleaning up process, uh, which may happen after death. And that's, that's, that's the purgation, that's the cleansing uh, system that, that God has given to enable us to make that final step into his presence. Um, it's not based on works, it's based on God's grace, um, but nonetheless it needs to happen. What else should we say about his, his practice of Anglicanism? Um, well, I think one of the most striking things about his practice of Anglicanism was his, uh, once he decided to start flying his flag, as you said, how faithful he was to daily worship, uh, to going to communion. And one of the things that I would commend to you, if you've not seen the movie The Most Reluctant Convert, uh, it's just an excellent movie on many levels, um, not least of which that it features the Reverend Dr. Michael Ward <laughs> as the Anglican <laughs> vicar at the beginning. But it, it's very, uh, I love the way that the story is framed because it starts with Lewis uh, not really as a believer in a church service, not really understanding it. He talks about how he went through confirmation as an atheist and made a mockery of what was being done during that time because he did it just because of family pressure. But then when he came to back to the faith in later years, um, the practice of worship and the sacraments became incredibly meaningful to him. And uh, you see at the end of the movie is going to communion as a believer and the, and the difference that that makes. And it is, it, it's really quite a beautiful thing. It's also, may I interrupt briefly? Um, it's, it's, it was quite a beautiful thing to be part of that movie. Um, the, the director, Norman Stone, had previously made a, a, a documentary about my work on Narnia for the BBC. And, and when he was making this film about Lewis's um, conversion, um, he thought that I um, would, would, would not be so bad an actor um, <laughs> that I would ruin the movie um, by playing his parish priest. Um, and so I did two days' work on the movie, and it was, it was um, most remarkably meaningful and um, moving experience because uh, there I was sitting in the in the vicar's stall at Holy Trinity heading to Quarry, the very church where Lewis worshipped. Um, there's a Narnia window on one side of the church. Uh, there's a little brass plaque in the pew where Lewis used to sit. And there I am sitting in the, in the vicar's stall um, and I'm looking out into the congregation full of extras and actors and there are two people playing C.S. Lewis. One is the young man and one is the older Lewis reflecting upon his earlier life. And that both actors were very well cast physically uh, to look like Lewis in his 20s and Lewis in his 50s. Um, and the church was pumped full of this sort of dry ice, so give it atmosphere. And we were singing this lovely 
Christmas Carol uh, in the bleak midwinter. Um, and I'm looking up, seeing two C.S. Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> and also know that a hundred yards out in the churchyard is where he's buried. Um, and I must confess, I, I got a, a kind of holy shiver. It was, it was really quite splendid. And, and then, in the, in the climactic scene of the movie, C.S. Lewis, having returned to the practice of the faith on Christmas Day, 1931, I think it was, he finally presents himself for, to receive communion. Um, and I give him communion. <laughs> um, it was really most marvellous. I, I, I felt there was something weird going on. Um, it was such a privilege. And, and the film, if you haven't seen it, is called The Most Reluctant Convert. It's, it's a very faithful ad adaptation, really, of Lewis's autobiography, Surprised by Joy. Almost all the, all the script is taken directly from Lewis's own words. So it's a very accurate portrayal, and um, I commend it to you. Yes, and I would commend, I think that wasn't something weird going on in that moment. I think it was the Holy Spirit, because even <laughs> watching the film, if you can watch that scene without tearing up, um, you might just want to check yourself and make sure that you still got a soul. <laughs> But it's, it's quite wonderful. And, you know, one of the things about Lewis is that, and we've heard some of this from Dr. Reichen during the conference, um, Lewis had various views on various aspects of theology uh, that were his more or less privately held views that he didn't want to be pigeonholed about. And so here, uh, you know, as evangelical Anglicans, we would not see eye to eye with him about purgatory, but we would certainly embrace uh, the, the main things, obviously, about his uh, understanding of the Christian faith. And one of the things that was also said at the conference that I think was quite remarkable was there was a picture put up of Lewis in 1917 as an atheist, as a young man <coughs> at Oxford. And I can't remember if it was Alistair McGrath or who it was that put that up. But he said, think about what's going through that young man's mind that 19-year-old uh, atheist getting ready to go off to the First World War, brilliant at Oxford University, could he ever have imagined that years later we would be gathered in Charleston, South Carolina, talking about his profound Christian influence on so many people across the world. And it was a great moment for us to think about how important it is to never give up on anyone. Imagine if Tolkien had thought, well, Lewis is too smart and too set in his atheism to talk about the faith with. And this whole idea of Lewis of telling stories that will draw us into the faith, I think is so very important um, for us to understand. And one of the things from the conference was talking about telling our own stories to help draw people in. And part of the conference also talked, too, about the culture in which we find ourselves. And many of us, when we look at our culture today, our tendency is to just throw up our hands and say, the end is nigh. Um, and, and there may be some truth to that. But one of the remarkable things about Lewis, and uh, Dr. Peter Craft gave a brilliant presentation about Lewis's prophet. And he talked about how he believed that Lewis, is, that the two most important books that anyone could read are Aldous Huxley's Brave New World and C.S. Lewis's The Abolition of Man, which is a series uh, that were originally essays that was also uh, then portrayed fictionally in the novel That Hideous Strength. And Dr. Ward, after his triumph with Planet Narnia, has gone where the angels feared to tread and, and taken on the abolition of man, which although it's short, is I think probably Lewis's densest work to try to understand. Although Lewis said he thought it was perhaps the most important thing that he had ever written. And Dr. Ward's book, After Humanity, which I had hidden in the closet back there but couldn't find this morning, uh, is an absolutely brilliant book that takes the abolition of man line by line and unpacks the entire thing. And I would love to hear from you a little bit about 
Why do you think Lewis thought that the abolition of man was so important, and how do we see unfolding before us today some of the things that Lewis predicted would happen? Yes, he did regard the abolition of man as, as possibly his best book. Um, although it is, as you say, very dense, it's, it originated as three philosophy lectures that he gave at the University of Durham in the 1940s. Uh, and he's operating at quite a high academic register. And I'm not a philosopher, so when you said that I, I ventured where angels fear to tread, I know precisely what you mean. Um, and I only ventured in that direction because I was asked to. It, it wasn't an idea I had had, but someone said, we want to publish a new edition of The Abolition of Man, will you write a foreword? So I began writing this foreword, and as I wrote, I thought, first, I need to say this, and I need to add that. And it grew and it grew and it grew, until it was almost a standalone book in its own right. Um, so I, I found that I'd written not just a foreword, but a complete guide. Um, <laughs> so that's how it came about. I was really guiding myself into, into the work, because I'm no philosopher. And I find the abolition man very difficult myself, but I think that's possibly um, to, to the advantage of the book, because I don't take anything for granted. I, I don't assume that readers will find this work either. I don't find it easy. Um, so yes, I wrote Path of Humanity and learnt a lot in the process. And one of the things I learnt was, I think, to understand why Lewis regarded it as so important in one of his best works. Because the abolition of man is, is, is all about objective value which sounds a bit dull, but it's, <laughs> but it's really absolutely crucial to all our lives. You know, when we say something is valuable, is it, you know, is it good, is it true, is it beautiful, are we saying something that is objective, i.e. that is separate from our own perspective, or are we just projecting our own view upon the matter? Are we just asserting our own will over the world, or are we just, or are, or are we rather perceiving a reality which is there? Are we discovering something, or are we making it up? And that's such an absolutely crucial philosophical question to get straight. So could we could we say that's the difference between absolute truth and speaking your own truth? Yes, that is effectively it. Um, you know, are you? the determiner of, of all that's good, true, and beautiful, or are you actually required through discipline, humility, virtue, um, are you required to discover what is good, true, and beautiful? And of course, as Christians, we would say the latter, um, that God is, is the supreme value. God is goodness and truth and beauty himself. And we come to know him as he is. Uh, which sometimes is quite painful, as I was saying in my sermon. You know, the, the, the matter of trial and tribulation and testing is, is a major part of coming to know reality in itself, rather than reality as we would like it to be. Um, but growth in wisdom is essential if we are to perceive reality correctly, rather than just sort of retreat into some almost um, private value system um, th there's no joy in that. There's no, there's no community in that. You, you, it's almost solipsistic in its... In its uh, well, you define solipsistic <laughs> for us. Um, solipsism is basically the, the, the only reality is that which I perceive. Um, I'm sort of locked in my own head, as it were. Uh, and, and you all could be just projections, phantasms of my own imagining. Um, are you real? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> so anyway, Lewis himself, uh, in his teens and early twenties, had really wrestled with this problem. He said that he became a, a theist, a believer in God, and ultimately a Christian, largely as an escape from solipsism. This idea that he was possibly locked into his own private perceptions. Uh, and through a long painful process of wrestling with this idea, then to say, no, value is objective. And that was actually what led him down the path of returning to faith. Um, it's, it's quite an important philosophical starting point, um, a, a launch pad, as it were, to, to more sort of theological and spiritual questions. Unless value is 
believe to be objective. What's the point of, of telling people to, to read the Bible, to come to church, or to believe the gospel? Because uh, they would say, well, that's good for you, that's, but it's not true for me, and I'm the determiner of truth. So you've got to settle this question first. And that's why I think Lewis regarded it as such an important book in his own output, that it sort of underlies almost everything else he ever wrote. You, you might always say, as I actually ended up saying in Art of Humanity, that the abolition of man is one of the theme of his output, and all the other books are the variations. They, they vary into literary criticism, and poetry, and fiction, and apologetics. But underlying it all is this belief that, that value is objective and we can discover it. Thanks be to God. It's not easy, it's not simple, and there will be legitimate uh, disagreements about what constitutes value, but unless it is objective, there's no point in even disagreeing with people. Yes. Yeah, yeah so I commend that book to you. If, if you never did anything else in your life, the fact that you have brought that book back, the sales of the abolition of man were probably going like this, and then when After Humanity came out, they went like this. So uh, it is a very important book, and one of the things Lewis does that's so interesting is he connects this problem of losing objective value, losing objective truth, beauty, and goodness to the failures of the education system and how important it is to write the education system if you want to produce uh, what he called men with chests, uh, those that could live a life of virtue. So we are, we are starting to get toward the end of our time together, and I would love to hear from you a little bit about what might be your favorite passage out of the Chronicles of Narnia, and why. <laughs> I know that's a tough question. That is a tough question. There are so many. The Narnia Chronicles are beautiful works, and they all have excellent bits in them. I think my favorite book as a whole is The Voyage of the Dawn Curve. But possibly my favorite passage, single passage, is the one I quoted in my talk yesterday morning. Uh, from the horse and his boy. And the horse and his boy, I, I, when I was a boy, I didn't much like that story. Uh, but now I think it's one of the best. And that passage I quoted where uh, Shasta, the, the hero of the story, meets a mysterious voice in the dark and in the mist and doesn't know who it is um, and tells this voice his life story and how miserable he's been, how lonely and, and abused and and hungry he is, and he, he relates truly enough his own backstory to this mysterious voice in the darkness. Then the voice said, I do not call you unfortunate. And then the voice retells to Shasta his whole life story from another perspective. And, and all these apparent disasters and problems were actually providentially managed to bring Shasta to this very point. It's so beautifully done. Um, it's called The Unwelcome Fellow Traveller, the chapter. And the Unwelcome Fellow Traveller turns out to be this Christ-like lion, Aslan. Uh, and that moment of encounter, when uh, there's a complete transformation in, in Shasta's perception about himself and his world, uh, is just an absolutely fantastic depiction of conversion, really, and the scales forming from your eyes, and the, the whole paradigm of your perspective on reality Thrown for a loop, rotated to 180 degrees. Um, a horse and his boy, and that passage in particular, um, everyone should know it. And that, that's why I spent so much time on it yesterday. Because we were talking about telling a more beautiful story. Um, and here in The Horse and His Boy, Aslan literally does tell Shasta a more beautiful account of his own story, and that he had been getting it wrong. Um, there, there's another perspective. Um, it's, it's superb. And do you remember what the very last line of that is? I was the... Well, yes, there's a, a long passage about yes. I, I can't quote it off the top of my head, but um, go and look at it yourself. Yes, <laughs> I'm tempted to quote it. Which I, will, uh, I will butcher it, but the thing that's most beautiful about it is exactly what Michael is saying that through this passage, you see what, it's very much like the story of Joseph, uh, when he comes and speaks to his brothers and said, 
What you meant for evil, God meant for good. And you see how all these things, the chest has been weighed down by and misunderstood that actually God was working his purpose through all of those circumstances, going back to the very time of Shasta as an orphan cast adrift on this boat out on the sea, and Aslan closing that just beautiful paragraph saying, mine was the hand that pushed the boat toward the shore where the fisherman was waiting who would find you, who adopted him and brought him up. And it's just a profoundly beautiful example of the uh, deep care of God, even in times where we may not be aware of it. So on that note, I think we're out of time. Um, let me uh, say a prayer for us. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for the gift and ministry of Dr. Ward. We thank you for his time with us here this weekend. We thank you for the conference and for all of these speakers. Lord, we pray you would use all of the words that were spoken in this conference and here today to draw your people more and more deeply into the things of your kingdom, that we might be emboldened to tell the story, the most beautiful story of the gospel, and to share our own story of how you have loved us from before the foundation of the world. Lord, we thank you for your love and mercy and grace, and we thank you for Dr. Ward's being with us. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.